Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here uh, at First Assembly. And I know it's cold outside, so that's why I got my beach background here to remind me of summer and uh, fun days that are coming ahead. So uh, I hope you're warm. I hope you're doing well. And uh, just want to thank you for joining us today. As always, I just want to say a few things. If you would like to give to this ministry, we uh, appreciate your giving. And those of you who have been giving have been really been a blessing to us and uh, if you would like to give go to capemayfirstassembly.org forward slash donate and uh, you can uh, give there you could get to a secure page and uh, give and if um, uh, you could also text to give at 609-400-4075 well this morning I like to talk to you about peace uh, we are in a series called uh, Reset, and we're talking about uh, resetting for the new year, and uh, and one of the things that really we need to reset on is peace. What what steals our peace? Because whatever's stealing your peace, uh, you, it, it tells you really where your heart is. It really tells you where the things that you love are, the things that steal your peace, the things that worry you, the things that concern you. So uh, before we get started, I just want to show a, a quick video on peace, and um, and and uh, I just um, would like to show this to you, uh, and it really talks about the word shalom. Uh, that's a, the biblical word we get peace from and what it means, so uh, enjoy this video. The word peace is common in most languages. People can talk about peace treaties or times of peace. It means the absence of war. And in the Bible, the word peace can refer to the absence of conflict, but it also points to the presence of something better in its place. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And in the New Testament, the Greek word is erene. The most basic meaning of shalom is complete or whole. The word can refer to a stone that has a perfect whole shape with no cracks. It can also refer to a completed stone wall that has no gaps and no missing bricks. Shalom refers to something that's complex with lots of pieces that's in a state of completeness, wholeness. It's like Job who says his tents are in a state of shalom because he counted his flock and no animals are missing. This is why shalom can refer to a person's well-being. Like when David visited his brothers on the battlefield, he asked about their shalom. The core idea is that life is complex, full of moving parts and relationships and situations. And when any of these is out of alignment or missing, your shalom breaks down. Life is no longer whole. It needs to be restored. In fact, that's the basic meaning of shalom when you use it as a verb. To bring shalom literally means to make complete or restore. So Solomon brings shalom to the unfinished temple when he completes it. Or if your animal accidentally damages your neighbor's field, you shalom them by giving them a complete repayment for their loss. You take what's missing and you restore it to wholeness. The same goes for human relationships. In the book of Proverbs, to reconcile and heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. And when rival kingdoms make shalom in the Bible, it doesn't just mean they stop fighting, it also means they start working together for each other's benefit. This state of shalom is what Israel's kings were supposed to cultivate, and it rarely happened. So the prophet Isaiah, he looked forward to a future king, a prince of shalom. And his reign would bring shalom with no end. A time when God would make a covenant of shalom with his people and make right all wrongs and heal all that's been broken. This is why Jesus' birth in the New Testament was announced as the arrival of Irene. Remember, that's the Greek word for peace. Jesus came to offer his peace to others, like when he said to his followers, my peace I give to you all. The apostles claimed that Jesus made peace between messed up humans and God when he died and rose from the dead. 
The idea is that he restored to wholeness the broken relationship between humans and their creator. This is why the Apostle Paul can say Jesus himself is our Irene. He was the whole complete human that I am made to be but have failed to be. And now he gives me his life as a gift. And this means that Jesus' followers are now called to create peace. Paul instructed local churches to keep their unity through the bond of peace, which requires humility and patience and bearing with others in love. Becoming people of peace means participating in the life of Jesus, who reconciled all things in heaven on earth, restoring peace through his death and resurrection. So peace takes a lot of work because it's not just the absence of conflict. True peace requires taking what's broken and restoring it to wholeness, whether it's in our lives, our relationships, or in our world. And that's the rich biblical concept of peace. Give me just a second here. Okay, I'm going to go. Just a sec. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, take this video. Um, I'm trying to X out on this video. It's not letting me. That's weird. Okay. Um, ah, one more time. Um, Right. Okay, because I gotta show you my uh, my PowerPoint. <laughs> so I'm trying to get the video out of the way. Uh, so uh, part three in our uh, in our series on reset, and that is living in peace. And I want to read to you this scripture, and uh, you may uh, find it familiar. If um, you may find it familiar, you may have uh, heard it before. Um, but it's from John 14. It says. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Um, and so uh, I want to talk about living in peace today because there are so many things that steal our peace from us. And, um, and I, I love the video that we just watched because it talks about peace, not just uh, a situation where we feel good, but, a, but peace has to do with wholeness. It has to do with how we're interacting with our family. It has to do with how we're interacting with the world. Most of all, it has to do with how we're interacting with God. And um, we struggle in the area of peace because we're fallen people. And so you take any two people, you put them together, uh, the relationship is going to break down. And it can be re rebuilt again, but there's always going to be a breakdown in any relationship. Uh, that two humans have at some point. Uh, there's there's going to be conflict. There's going to be difficulty. Uh, and that's the same thing in our relationship with God. We, uh, we fall into places where we lose our peace with God. Now, I'm not talking about in, in, a, um, in a sense of how we stand with God, because what Christ has done for us is not going to be undone. So, uh, so, so just because I feel like I'm not connected with God or I don't have peace with God doesn't mean that God hasn't forgiven my sins. Uh, it just means that I'm not in a place of peace. I'm not in a place of shalom. I'm not in a place of wholeness. And so uh, in John 14, we see Jesus give this incredible message of peace. And he talks about um, what it means to have peace and who he is. And so first thing I want to say to you today, that is, if, if there's something that constantly takes your peace away, uh, that is a sign that your heart is divided. If, if for instance, uh, you, um, you're constantly losing your peace over finances, that means your heart is divided between uh, Christ, who is the author of peace, and your, your finances and your love uh, for your finances or your love for the stability that finances give. Uh, if your peace is always being taken away by a certain person, uh, it shows that there may be a divided heart in your life. And all of us deal with this. All of us struggle with this. Uh, that uh, if we were all living in this perfect zone uh, with Jesus all the time, we would just be living in constant peace. But what we ultimately always have to do is we always have to reconnect with Jesus 
to reestablish our peace. Now, when I say, again, I'm not talking about how we stand with God. I'm talking about that relationship. I'm talking about that sense of peace that we have, that we can face things, we can we we can have difficulties come into our lives, but we can still face them. And the reason why we can do that is because of the peace that Christ gives. So the first thing, uh, the first reason that we can have peace is because we have a home. And um, this is, I'm going to read you the scripture. This is one that is often misquoted. And uh, this is so beautiful when you understand what it really says. He said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. This is right after the scripture that I just read, by the way, at the Last Supper. Uh, he, he, believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house, my father's house has many rooms. If that weren't so, uh, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, will I come back and take you with me? So, with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way and the place where I am going. Um, and I and that that's my second point there. But let me get back here. I want to um, want to share with you something that's really incredible about this. If you have an old King James Bible, uh, there there's a there's a sentence in the scripture that. Uh, the wrong word is used. The wrong word was interpreted, and that is the word mansions. Uh, you may have heard it like this. In my father's house, there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. Now, that became very popular in thought, right? Because um, people think to myself, especially uh, during the Great Depression, people would say, one day I'm going to have a mansion, and it's going to be so beautiful. And uh, the the things that I'm struggling with in this world are going to be gone. And even though I'm struggling with poverty right now, I'm going to be living in a mansion. It's going to be sweet in heaven. Now that's a great thought, and I'm not I'm not um, making fun of that thought or anything. We even sang a song in the old days, uh, an old hymn uh, called "I Have a Mansion Just Over the Hilltop." I won't sing that. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you the singing. Uh, so, uh, but, but the point is this, that's not what it says. And what it really does say is so much more amazing and so much more powerful. Uh, think about it. Inside someone's house isn't a mansion, right? So the statement, in my father's house, there are many mansions, is not really a, a good statement. But uh, God, didn't, God didn't send Christ to the cross rising from the dead, uh, so that he could call us and put us in a mansion. God did that. The Father did that so he could put us in his home. And that is so much more powerful. Um, God has a home for us. See, um, I could right now, well, I can't, but if I were rich, I could buy you a mansion in the Hamptons and, uh, and say, here you go. But that mansion wouldn't give you peace. It wouldn't if 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 even if living in a mansion is what you love and saying to yourself, if I had a mansion, then I would have peace. I can guarantee you, you would not have peace and see because your peace comes from God and see God isn't calling us to a mansion. He's calling us to him. He's calling us to his home. And that is so much more powerful. Jesus is saying here in my father's house, there are many rooms. There's a there's a place for you to live, not down the street from my father, not, uh, you know, not, not even next door to my father. He's saying in my father's house, there are many rooms. There's a place for you right inside my father's house. And, and that's powerful because what we really want and what we really desire is to reconnect with God again, like we did in the Garden of Eden. And now we get to do it again. Because that's where our peace is. We were created to share the joy of life with God and for God to share his joy with us. That's why we were created. And so it's not much of a comfort to think one day I'm going to live in a mansion in heaven. It's much more powerful to think one day I'm going to live in God's home. Uh, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And this really makes us think of the... Uh, the marriage engagement in the Old Testament or in, or in the Old and New Testament. And, and the way it was done with the Jewish people is uh, when you were engaged, 
uh, you couldn't just break up like we, you know, today you could be engaged to someone and just break up. Uh, you couldn't do that because you were uh, legally married to that person, even though you haven't come together in a full way in marriage. Uh, but you had committed to marry that person. And what would happen is uh, the uh, parents would get together and they would make this arrangement. And then the groom would go and with the help of his father, build a room, usually attached to their house for his wife. And then when it was time, he would come with a big celebration and he would take his wife and he would bring her home to the room prepared for her. Um, and, and so this, this is what Jesus is saying. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you and you don't know when it's going to happen, but it's, what's going to happen is I'm going to return and I'm going to come and, and with the, the procession, with the, um, uh, with the angels, with, uh, with, with, with the whole wedding perception, this is what would happen is that, uh, that, you know, the bride would be waiting and then all of a sudden the groom would come and there'd be a big party and they would have the big wedding, but he wouldn't do that till the place was ready that he prepared for her. Um, we can have peace because our, our Heavenly Father has prepared a place for us. Our Heavenly Father wants us to live in his home, and Jesus has prepared a place for us because we are his bride, and he's calling us to himself. And, and so uh, one day we look forward to the day where he will return and take his bride uh, to our home uh, to be with him. See, if that doesn't give you peace, what nothing else will. The fact that... Um, Jesus is simply away for a short period of time. We've been given the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about that in just a few moments. Uh, but, um, but he's gone to prepare a place in the home of the Father so that we can be with him. So I thank God that Jesus isn't preparing a mansion for me. He's preparing a place right in the home of the Father. That's what heaven really is. Heaven's the home of the Father. And uh, we're going to live on a new heavens and a new earth. We're going to live in his home. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit more. But let me get to uh, my second point here this morning. And uh, not only do we have a home, but we have a way. Um, we have a way. Let me read you the next scripture. I'm trying to, I got a mouse that's not working here. Um, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Um, We don't only have a home, we have a way. Um, we experienced with our father Adam, we experienced um, true communion with God. Every day God walked with Adam in the cool of the day. He had communion, complete communion, complete friendship with God. He had shalom. He had peace in the Garden of Eden. Uh, if you and, and of course he fell. If you fast forward to the building of the temple, uh, and, and it describes the architecture of the temple. Uh, there are uh, pomegranates in there. There are trees. This is what they put into uh, the, the engravings of the temple. And there's water. Uh, so there, there's a lot there. Um, and the, um, the lampstand in, inside isn't a lampstand. It's a tree, right? It's in the shape of a tree. And so what the, what the temple is is a new garden of Eden, right? That's what really, that's really what Solomon built. He said uh, what he was really doing was building a new Eden where God can come and dwell with us and live with us. Uh, Jesus said, tear down this temple and in three days I will rebuild it again. And the scripture says he was talking about his body, right? Himself. Um, and so what Jesus was saying is, the new Garden of Eden, the new place where you meet with God is with him. And and see, just like unlike the temple that was kind of like a, a fake Garden of Eden, that or not a fake, but an incomplete Garden of Eden that looked forward to a day when the Garden of Eden would be destroyed, restored, <laughs> uh, where the peace that we found in that garden would be restored. Um, Jesus is the real temple. Jesus is the real garden. Jesus is the real one. 
that that allows us to be in God's presence, to be with the Father. So not only have we have a home, but we have a way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's an astounding statement. Uh, Jesus isn't uh, just saying, hey, I'm going to point to the way, which every other religious leader has done in the history of the world. They have pointed to the way and said, if you find that, if you go that way, you'll find the way. Uh, and, and if you work real hard, you'll get there. That's No, that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, I think this was said by uh, C.S. Lewis. He said, uh, Jesus is either a lunatic, a liar, or the son of God. He wasn't a great teacher, simply a great teacher, because it, he didn't say, here's some ways, here's some things, here's some uh, Here's some principles to apply to your life to make your life better. He said, no. He said, you need a way. You need a way to your shalom. You need a way to your peace. You, and Jesus says, I am the way. See, our, our peace is connected with God. And so he is our peace. He is our shalom. He is the one that connects us with God. Uh, thirdly, uh, this morning, um, come on, this stupid mouse. I, it's driving me nuts. Okay. Um, okay. Um, we have an advocate, and uh, we have a we have a home. We have a way. We have an advocate. Verse twenty six says, "But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you." Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. I'm sorry, another, uh, another version says troubled, and I'm used to saying that. Do not let your hearts be afraid. You, you've heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for I, for the Father is greater than I. So, Jesus, uh, Jesus says two things. He's going to give us an advocate, and he's going to give us peace. And, and I like what Jesus says here. He says, um, I don't give peace like the world gives peace. So let's just think about how the world gives peace. The world may say, well, look, peace is in your family. Uh, a lot of things in um, modern movies now, uh, especially kids' movies, will, will usually show uh, the guy that's overworked and he's ignoring his kids, and then he realizes that his family is the most important thing. And his family is where he's going to find peace. But the thing is, that breaks down, doesn't it? Because... Uh, your family isn't perfect. Um, conflict happens in your family. Children don't turn out exactly like you think they're going to turn out. Sometimes everyone gets along. Sometimes people don't get along. Uh, so if the if you say, uh, I'm going to get peace in my family, uh, you're going to have peace sometimes, but you're going to have to get it all together. There's a movie uh, me and my wife really enjoy when we first got married. Uh, we, I think it was our first date. It's a movie called Why You Were Sleeping. It's a great little movie. Uh, Sandra Bullock, one of her first movies, you know, back in the day when she was, you know, a lot younger. And and um, there's a scene in the movie uh, that that is just um, really great. The, the dad and son are sitting together. It's nothing deep or anything, but the dad and the son are sitting together. It's towards the end of the movie. And the son wants to tell his dad that he doesn't want his business. And right before the son tells him that, the dad says this. He says, you know, you work your whole life. And um, everything is just, uh, you know, it's just hard. But then for a moment, everybody's happy. And at that moment, you have peace. And then right after that, the son says, well, dad, this isn't one of those moments. And then he goes on to tell him that he doesn't want the business that the dad's going to give him. And, and, uh, and it's just a great picture of what it's like for us. We put our hope in our family and we say, um, 
if uh, if it's just if I just had peace in my family, then it'd be great. But that only lasts for a moment. Um, uh, if it's financial stability, it only lasts for a moment because there's always something coming to take your financial stability away. If it's um, uh, if, if it's uh, being famous, well, we know how quick fame can just uh, the piece of fame can just dissipate. So many famous people just fall into self-destructive lives because we're not meant to be famous. We're not meant to be the center of everything, and we can't handle that. Um, and so uh, those are areas where the world gives us peace. And Jesus says, I don't give peace like the world gives. Jesus is a continue, continuous source of peace. He's peace that we can have when everything else around us is going wrong because he is our peace. He is our shalom. He is the one that, that fulfills the longings of our heart and the longings of our heart is to be connected with God. That's where we want to be. And that's where we have that moment. I had a friend of mine uh, that I was speaking to uh, last week. And he said, um, he was he's a black man. And he said, uh, I, he went into uh, the Wawa to get gas. And um, the guy that was giving him gas, you know, just was, was a white guy uh, that kind of looked like, uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, kind of like a redneck type of guy, I guess. But uh, they, 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 he started pumping his gas, and he, they started talking about the weather or something. And he said, you know, for a moment, I forgot I was black, I, and I forgot he was white. And we were just talking as human beings. And, and it was just like this wonderful moment of peace that I rarely have. Because for that moment, I didn't have to think about what made us different. And I didn't have to think about the tension. Um, and, and that's what we deal with with worldly peace. It does come, but it comes momentarily. It comes fleeting. Uh, for a moment, it seems like we can get everything together. We can, we can build that perfect brick. We can, we can put everything together and everything fits. And then just as quickly as everything comes together, it falls apart. That's why Jesus said, I'm going to give you an advocate. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? He speaks of Christ. He shows us Christ. So when our world begins to fall apart, what does the advocate do? He says, look at Christ. He says, see Christ. See that you have, you have a relationship with Christ. You have a relationship with the Father that has been restored, that is at perfect peace. Uh, he shows us and he's an advocate for us. And I also love that not only is he an advocate in the sense that uh, he uh, is shown us Christ, but he's an advocate in the sense that he is uh, interceding for us just like Christ is, the, the great high priest. God is interceding to God on our behalf. I just want you to catch that. God is interceding to God on our behalf. That's why Paul said, if Christ be for us, who can be against us? So we're gonna leave you, I want to leave you with this uh, today. Um, don't let anyone steal your peace. If you, it, one of the most important resets we can make for 2022 uh, is to walk in peace. And we're not going to walk in peace when we keep grabbing after the things of the world. We're only going to walk in peace when we see Jesus when we allow the Holy Spirit to show Jesus to us. Well, that's all I have for you today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Enjoy this day. I know it's cold. It's brisk outside. Uh, but, uh, but this is only a few weeks, and then it'll be springtime again. And uh, here I am. I'm just swimming in my beach right here, enjoying the sun. So God bless you today, and uh, I have a wonderful day. I'm going to pray for you. Father, I pray for everyone in the sound of my voice right now. I pray for just a supernatural move of your Holy Spirit in their lives. I pray, Lord God, that we would walk in peace. We would walk in power. And God, we just give you thanks and honor. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Uh, the Lord bless you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace in Christ's name. Amen.